Welcome to the belly up. Um, my name is Peter Jackson. I'm chief scientist for Thomson Reuters. So you've got a scientist introducing a session about journalists, but this is Aspen after all. Um, Thomson Reuters uh, is very proud and pleased to be uh, one of the sponsors of this event. Uh, we are a global uh, information and news business. Um, we're in very many verticals. Um, financial information, legal, science, healthcare, tax and accounting, and so forth. And um, I guess we're in a very fortunate position that all of those professional customers are very interested in the news. So um, it's not a huge stretch for us to keep a, a newswire service going uh, to field you know, 3,000 journalists around the world you know, covering the action as it happens on the ground. So um, we have a very um, star-studded panel here for you this evening, and I'm going to let our moderator, um, Jerry Murdoch, make the introduction. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Peter. Welcome, and good evening, everyone. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is let each panelist introduce themselves, and we'll come back for questions. So as he said, my name's Jerry Murdoch. I'm the co-founder of Inside Venture Partners and also a trustee of the Aspen Institute. And in the spirit of full disclosure, Inside Venture Partners has invested in many social media companies, such as Twitter and Flipboard. And just so we know that uh, the guy's names come up at all, sounds not, nothing to do with me. Okay, to my right, Pete Cashmore. I'm Pete Cashmore. I'm the founder and CEO of Mashable, which is a new site for digital and social influencers. We have 13 million monthly readers. Um, and we're really interested in how social media is revolutionizing all industries. We're about uh, using social media tools in your personal life, uh, in your business, and for, for nonprofit and, and cause-related issues. Um, yeah, and that's about it. It's a six-year-old uh, startup, I guess. Um, so that's Mashable. That's enough. <laughs> I'm Rajiv Chandrasekharan. I'm a senior editor at the Washington Post. I guess I'm the designated representative of old media here. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I have to, I, I will get uh, this uh, confession out of the way right at the beginning. While I have a Twitter account, I don't think I've ever sent a tweet in my life. So I think I may be the only panel, panelist not to have tweeted. Okay, at least a, a comrade in arms here. Um, I spent a couple years running uh, 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 department of the Washington Post that was trying to meld the uh, old school print newspaper newsroom with our website. Um, that has now uh, occurred. And uh, so I work at a newspaper where we're, we're trying to embrace uh, the new world of social media uh, while I uh, go off and do really bad things like uh, write really, really long stories that can't be tweeted or easily linked on Facebook. Uh, my name is Orville Shell. Um, and I'm a longtime writer, uh, journalist, and was dean for many years of the uh, Graduate School of Journalism at the University of California, Berkeley. But my real field is China, and it, that always introduces a very curious new element in any discussion about uh, new media, social media, or the internet. I'm Vivian Schiller. I am uh, just coming to the end of a four-month career interregnum. Um, on July 11th, I'm going to be joining NBC News as Chief Digital Officer, uh, a newly created position to figure out a digital strategy for NBC News. Prior to that, um, most recently, I was President and CEO of NPR. Prior to that, I was the uh, General Manager of NYTimes.com, the New York Times website. Prior to that, I was in television at Discovery, CNN, and Turner Broadcasting. I heard some applause out there for you <laughs> here and there, too. Uh, so my name is Thomas Goetz. I am executive editor of Wired Magazine, and uh, where we where we write about this stuff and also try to participate in it. I um, I also uh, like Orville. I have a subspecialty, be in, including my, or beyond my Wired tasks, which is um, health and medicine, which is what I write about. And I um, have been blogging, which is a form of social media, on and off since 1998, which is a neat segue to Ariana Huffington. And um, I am uh, now the president and editor-in-chief of the AOL Huffington Post Media Group, which was created after AOL acquired the Huffington Post, which I co-founded in May 2005. 
And um, since the merger, we brought together the AOL sites with the Huffington Post sites uh, and um, are now run a combination of a journalistic enterprise with a total of 1,350 professional journalists at the local and national level and a platform available for thousands of bloggers to blog every day on whatever interests them from politics to sleep and shoes and um, anything at all. And actually, Rajiv, I believe there will always be newspapers. I think um, it's a hybrid future coming along, a convergence between Mashable and the Washington Post. Great, thank you. Um, you may notice that Ariana is going to have to leave a little early this evening. So if she walks off the panel, don't think she's offended or <laughs> anything like that. But she has another engagement. So because she is going to leave first, I'm going to start with the first question for you, Ariana. Um, your company, as you just said, was sold to AOL um, for over $300 million, which is about 25% the market cap of the New York Times. Um, assuming that your acquirers are rational people, they must think your company is going to grow um, and be worth at least, what, maybe half of the New York Times or maybe the same value as the New York Times. How, how, do, you, um, how do you think about that? And, and do you think you'll eventually have the same level of investigative journalism capability that the New York Times had at its peak? Well, let me first of all say that I love the New York Times and the Washington Post, and I don't see it as a competition. I see it as, as I said earlier, combining professional journalism, the best of the old, fact-checking, accuracy, fairness, with the best of the new, which is about engagement. That's the paramount um, essence, if you want, of new media. And from the beginning, the Huffington Post was about social, was about community. We are about to hit our 100 millionth comment. And um, we, we got to that point by also avoiding the worst aspects of the internet, um, which is trolls, people hiding behind anonymity, by having a very advanced comment moderating technology and 30 human moderators 24 seven supplemented it. So I believe that we can actually uh, bring together the best of the internet as it's growing up uh, beyond its adolescent stage with the best of traditional media. I don't see it as either or. And our traffic keeps growing. Um, we passed the New York Times actually last month but I think the main reason for that is because leaders are increasingly looking for engagement. They don't want just to consume the news. They want to share the news, evolve it, develop it. You know, Will I Am, if I may end by quoting that great sage, Will I Am. <laughs> he said, we used to consume news sitting on a couch, and now we consume news galloping on a horse. We don't just consume it. You know, we share it, we pass it on. It's a very different experience, and really, self-expression has become the new entertainment. That's such a, so tell me, um, and any of the panelists, you can jump in here. Um, the Pew Research Organization last year put out an article about how news is consumed, and they entitled it Personal, Portable, um, and I think this sort of new trend is consumer behavior, where they want to participate in sharing the news, they want to comment on the news, they want to receive it in a way not in classic two-dimensional space-time of uh, a certain 7 o'clock on a certain ch channel or receive it in the morning paper, but they want to receive it when they want it in a personalized way. And they want to receive it on all the devices wherever they are. Anyone have a comment? Maybe you, Thomas? And well, yeah. I mean, I think, I think I mean, Massable is a great demonstration of that, the way they, they have, have created interfaces that, that pull people there as participants as much as, as readers. Um, Wired is, is one of our partner um, companies with Reddit, which um, is a, a uh, form of information that is created by the community as well as consumed by the community. It's a, it's a true blur in the sense that, that uh, akin to what Huffington Post has created. Um, I, I, think, I think it's the way I talk about it largely is, is as filters and conduits. So there's a form of media that we use as filters. So we, there's a huge amount of information out there. Everybody talks about too much information, information overload. And we still depend on media, often mainstream media, to filter all of that for us and provide channels that by which we consume what we want to consume. But also it's a conduit for people to communicate. 
and I think I think they're not they're not mutually exclusive, as as Ileana said. And I think that the fact that that we're creating hybrids is is a sign that we still the the core need to have information and curate information and deliver information is is uh, consistent throughout. I think there's something unique about uh, this generation. I mean, when I started Mashable, what I noticed very early on, and the reason that I kept doing it was that I, you know, put up this blog, write about you know technology and startups. And suddenly there were lots and lots of comments and people were emailing me and it became kind of a movement. And I think there's an expectation with this generation that uh, they want to participate, they don't want to be broadcast to, they don't want to sit and consume content, they want to be a part of a community. So whatever we do at Mashable, we think in terms of uh, how can we engage the community? We're a very small site, but we have massive reach. And the reason that we, that we have so much reach is that all of our readers are essentially um, our distribution channel. They're, they're almost all publishers themselves. They have these tens of thousands of Twitter followers and these hundreds of Facebook friends. And suddenly, you know, everyone has a broadcast channel. Everyone has a printing press and everyone wants to engage. They want to be the first one to spot that story, maybe on our site, maybe on other sites and share it out to their network. Um, and people also want to participate by contributing content. You know, a lot of our coverage now is, is you know, there'll be a breaking news story. So last month there was the Vancouver riots and we were getting all these twit pics sent in and people were saying, look at all this coverage. Are you guys going to pick up on twit pics and YouTube videos from the ground? I think it's happening on both sides. People want to participate by creating media and they want to participate by sharing media and it's essentially a printing press in their own hands. Great. Uh, tell me, Ariana, you spoke a little bit about, about engagement early, do you, do you see that this behavior is something that you're trying to, to honor? And, and, and the idea of what you just said about people wanting to contribute, you've been known for having a lot of citizen journalists, particularly early on, citizen journalists that are, that are actually publishing and you're publishing their work. Do you think there's going to be more citizen journalists? Tell me what? More citizen journalists? More citizen journalists? Yeah, people that are on the ground in the place that are, that are writing a tweet or something on their Facebook page or that actually get on their blog and that gets picked up and published by, say, Huffington Post. Oh, absolutely. I feel that, as, um, as you just said about Mashable, basically everybody with a laptop or even a smartphone um, has the power to broadcast. The question now is who is trusted? That's why, as Craig Newmark said, trust is the new black when it comes to media. You know, because you can broadcast, but are you going to be trusted? Are you going to be shared? And, and that's why increasingly, who is trusted is going to determine who, who has the most influence. But the old way of simply consuming the news at a certain time is, is completely gone. And, and one of the things that some in the mainstream media still are having trouble understanding is why are people spending so much time creating media without being paid? That's something which is still very hard for people to understand because they are confusing professional journalism with that self-expression um, that is basically now driving so much of what people do. You know, nobody ever questioned why are people sitting on a couch watching bad TV for five hours without being paid? Nobody ever asked that question, <laughs> right? <laughs> but people are saying, why are people blogging on the Huffington Post or updating uh, Wikipedia entries or um, putting stuff on the Facebook walls or whatever or creating videos for YouTube? And the truth is that people are loving that. Uh, it's a source of fulfillment. It's a source of tremendous engagement, and, and it's also about giving back. You know, there is an amazing amount that's being done, not just for themselves, but to promote a cause, to highlight a problem, to right a wrong. It, I don't want to sound incredibly idealistic, but I am about new media. I believe that um, it's, it's just while so much of what's happening in Washington, out of what the establishments are doing is dysfunctional, so much of what's happening on the ground is, um, is deeply encouraging. That, that's interesting. You just talk about Washington being dysfunctional. Today, Orville, on a panel, you talked about uh, civic engagement and uh, the media is sort of uh, dysfunctional. We're sort of in a tough state. We're, let's, let's, let's move back from social media specifically for a second and look at the overall world of media. Tell us your, your view of it, where we stand right now. Well, it's undeniable that... Um, you know, the mainstream media is in trouble largely because its business model has collapsed. 
and I think in inherent in that whole uh, equation is the fact that it's gotten perhaps too much driven by commerce. So it's seeking not niches really as it was promised on television and the internet but a lot of eyeballs. Um, you know, I, I don't want to be a strict constructionist, but um, am I wrong? Is, is our topic, uh, is social media good for journalism? Is that, is, was that the topic? No, something like that. <laughs> now, th let me just say one quick thing about that. I, I think we could turn that one around too and say, you know, is journalism good for social media? Because in fact, I think these two things really belong closely and intimately together. I don't know if you've ever made th this observation. Jet planes are sort of the highest level of technological sophistication. And yet, when you get in the jet plane, everybody has their nose in the book or their Kindle or their, or their whatever. And all of the social media, all of the internet interactions end, for most people, except for those rare few who Unless don't. you have Wi-Fi. Well, and, and there are a few people who are now doing that. But then when you get back down to the ground, you get back to this new world. And it, it, it is a kind of a reminder to me that um, I think social media would be rather hollow and have very little to discuss except I had a hamburger at Belly Up uh, without the mainstream media. And I think this is a, a connection which really needs to be highlighted, uh, how one uh, makes that partnership more functional. I, I don't know. But I'm, I, I'm not sure I fully agree that, that you know, mainstream media is somehow powering this, this social media or that everything that, I guess what's implied there is that everything that's being discussed in social media or a, a great deal of it is coming from uh, mainstream media. I think you know, when we talk about cell phones and we talk about empowerment, we talk about all these new sources of news. There's a lot of news breaking on Twitter right now. There's a lot of, you know, you can just be there on the scene. Generally, you're going to have an individual, a member of the public on the scene before you can get a reporter down there and something big happens. There's a tsunami, there's a riot, there's, there's something big happening, there's something sudden. You're not gonna have a reporter in place. That's going to break with someone posting a photo to Twitter or a YouTube video. Um, and then it's the job of an editor, of a professional to establish trust, right? We have all these photos being uploaded. It could be, you know, it could be an old photo. We don't know who the source is. So we need that layer, and that's the role for journalism going forward, is to be the layer, the curator, to say, okay, there's tons of media out there, but we need to establish trust. We need to select uh, what media is genuine. We need to uh, have trusted sources, and we need to just have a curation layer, and that's where journalism lies. I don't think that, that mainstream media is necessarily powering uh, all of what's happening on social. I think social can be the starting point, but it's very much the case that you still need journalists to be that trusted source, that curator. Uh, I, I think journalism goes well beyond curation of observed oh, details that, that, that come in. If, if, if our uh, global news content was simply driven by what people were seeing with their own eyes and tweeting, uh, boy, the, the, the public discourse would be, would be pretty shallow, at least in my humble opinion. Uh, you know, I, I feel like the guy who, who works at an enterprise where, you know, we go into the, into the mines every day with pickaxes and we chisel away the, the raw ore of facts. It's not very sexy. Uh, it can be a little hazardous. We don't get paid very well. Uh, and, and there are lots of other people who, who do a much better job of refining that stuff into, into uh, higher value products and make a lot more money. And we, what we're trying to do is obviously get into the business of, of not just uh, carting out uh, chunks of this ore, but also trying to, to, to turn it into, into product, into, into, into that valuable product that comes from social engagement and, 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 and the traffic that is generated that way from, from commenting and whatnot. Uh, but, but, it, but it's a difficult uh, transformation. I, I don't sit up here as a person who thinks that uh, social media is bad for, 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 for old media, for traditional journalism. Far from it. I actually think that, that um, the, the world of, of tweeting about stories and posting them to your Facebook walls and, and everything else that is, that is done in this world, uh, in, in the world of social media and how it relates to old school journalism, actually in some ways is good for us. It's very threatening. Um, it, it forces us um, to, 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 to improve our game. The old days of simply you know, churning out commoditized stuff that would fill the inside pages of a newspaper is no good anymore because nobody cares about that stuff. Nobody wants to, 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 to retweet it or, or to share it with their friends. And so it forces us to, to lift up our games. But, but, 
that, that involves an incredibly wrenching transition and one where, quite frankly, there isn't, as Orville noted, a very good business model for that and how we, we generate, you know, you moving from the days of, of, of the great big, uh, you know, monopoly urban newspapers that, uh, whose, whose owners saw it as a, as a public good to fund investigative journalism and to, to open up national and foreign bureaus, how we now, in a more competitive world, find the necessary revenue sources to sustain that sort of journalism that provides the necessary raw facts uh, for the worlds of social media to, to comment on and, uh, and to thrive on. Vivian? Yeah, I just wanted to tie what Rajiv and Pete and Ariana was saying about um, citizen journalism. I think the great power and potential of so many people being engaged in social media is less about the individual contributor, though there's rare exceptions, the guy that was the eyewitness to the Osama uh, uh, bin Laden raid, et cetera, et cetera. It is in the sheer numbers of eyewitnesses who can contribute, who can verify information, who can provide, who collectively can provide the kind of data that is in itself news gathering. It's not so much, I think there was once upon a time we thought, we in journalism believed that citizen journalism was about the amateur sitting on the, you know, standing on the corner with a microphone and his cell phone camera, whatever, saying, I'm here reporting. It's not that. It is, uh, here's what I'm experiencing, combined with what thousands and thousands of other people are experiencing, or on Twitter, a piece of information that is tweeted. Who can verify this information? And lots and lots of sources of people. This is what you've seen, you know, th this is what we've seen in the Arab Spring. This is what we've seen in um, coverage of polling places. This is what we see throughout. So it's less about the individual, though, again, sometimes you have, you know, the, the picture that nobody else has, than it is about the sheer scale and the wisdom of the crowd. Yeah, and uh, can I, if I just jump in, I, I think one of the things that, um, so, so citizen journalism, if you talk to um, Craig Newmark, who, who was a big pioneer of citizen journalism, he will admit it failed, right? The idea of expecting citizens to somehow uh, elevate themselves to the role of journalists does not work. It does not scale. They don't, they don't do it. They, that is not what people are, it actually, you d it, believe it or not, it takes some training. It takes some skills <laughs> to be a journalist. Um, but the key to social media, if, we, if we're going to conflate um, citizen journalism into something of social media, and, and I, one other thing that I think is utterly broken in social media is comments. I know you guys get a lot of comments, but comments, who reads an Arian, uh, uh, not a, a Huffington Post com uh, story that has six, 700 comments? Who reads that? Who, who goes through that? Who churns through that? Comments are a big failed kind of part that needs, oh, I'm, I'm, I gotta finish my point and then I'm gonna <laughs> let you finish. <laughs> the point is, my point is that social media and these technologies are good at, at experimentation and failure. So, so comments to me are a failure, um, but I'm sure there will be some refinement that you guys are cooking up right now that is going to solve it. And that's, that's the, that kind of quick churn, that failure mode is good to have. Uh, so where's the, where does uh, investigative journalism, is it better uh, for old line media to do investigative journalism? I mean, or is it people that are professional journalists saying, I'm going to write a blog, I'm going to do my own investigative story, and I'm going to publish on the Huffington Post? Well, you know, for me, we, we need to stop looking at everything as either or. It's all, everything, it's both. You know, there is investigative journalism at the moment being funded by not-for-profits like ProPublica. We launched the Huffington Post investigative fund that we've now merged with the Center for Public Integrity. There are a lot of new models. There is great investigative journalism being done at the local level, like San Diego Voices, Noon Post, etc. Great investigative journalism being done by traditional media. I think one of the great uh, additions of social media is a kind of obsessive following on big stories that maybe traditional media built. So one of the problems often has been that a big story is broken on the front page of the Washington Post or the New York Times, and it dies there because often mainstream media suffer from ADD. They are ready to go on to the next big story. And we suffer from OCD. You know, we obsess over a story. We, we kind of will take that story and then add a little nugget that we found or tweet it or stay on it until something happens. And that's a great contribution because after all, when you go down the mine and do all that hard work, you do it because you want to have an impact. You don't just do it because you, have, you want to find something to do. Now, in terms of comments, 
Now, the thing about comments is not that anybody sits there and reads all 4,000 comments that we sometimes get on one story. It's that there is a conversation that somebody comments and then somebody else responds and then somebody else contradicts it and then somebody else comes up with another fact. It's the, it's the conversation that happens uh, that is really fascinating. And the problem with comments in most um, places is that they are mixed with false and vile attacks and uh, spam and commercials, etc. That's why um, coming up with a more and more advanced technology of pre-moderation, uh, no, so far nobody has come up with a technology that does not require human yeah. addition, but that's something which I think everybody in the end is going to benefit from. So some people here talk about trust. You, you talked about trust. Do you think trust is changing and who gets it, how it's gotten? Do you trust a story in a major uh, media uh, organization or do you trust it because maybe some people you've in your social world and your social network have endorsed it and that social endorsement is now just as important as the content itself? I think we can have both trusted nodes and trusted sources. There's definitely people in my network who are you know, journalists who when they tweet something, they've generally verified it. Um, and we all know this when we're, you know, when we think about recommendations, when we think about who do I know that knows how to fix my car, we know that person. And we also know the person who, who do I know that's always accurate when they tweet stuff, and who's the person who just tweets stuff and doesn't really read the article. So I think we have trusted nodes, but I think we still have trusted sources. I think, you know, we very much watch, you know, when, you know, Michael Jackson dies, we look at TMZ and we go, we'll wait for the New York Times to cover it and then we'll cover it ourselves. You know, we're, we're waiting for that, we're digging. So I think there's, there's still trusted sources. Um, just coming back to the comments issue that, that was raised, I go to comments for a few reasons. Um, one of them is sentiment. You know when news happens, um, it's very rare that the, the, the factual basis, the news article you're reading is gonna offer any opinion. But you drop down to the comments and you can see how the world feels about this. You know, a politician won, or a scandal, or y you look to the comments to say, you know, am I in the minority, am I in the majority? What do people think about this? What we also do at Mashable is we use comments a great deal for additional information. So things like our story might be missing something and someone might know more, because our community is very, very connected. They're very connected in the tech world especially, but also uh, in other pursuits. And we also look for, we sometimes get corrected. You know, Sometimes we're wrong, it's, it's an evolving conversation. And sometimes someone in the comments will say, well, I have information that, that shows you're wrong, and they'll update or we'll do a new article. Uh, so I think comments are incredibly valuable. I think they do have um, a spam issue. We've just recently switched to people have to log in with Facebook or Twitter, and it creates a real identity. So we've, we've cut down on spam a huge amount by doing yeah, that. Yeah, and I'm not saying they don't have value. I'm just saying yeah. that, that the value, it maybe there's often internal value. I, I think they are broken. It is a broken system of, of gathering input from readers. Um, we need to come up with much better systems, whether it's... Whether I, I actually think they're almost the core of what's happening. They're almost as important, or they probably are as important as the article, because, um, you know, the article is one person's take on what's happening, and the comments are the world's take on what's happening. I, I guess I, I... Consider me a traditional journalist. I, I have a hard time believing... I mean, it goes, it goes to trust. It goes to all sorts of other, other things. It is very hard to um, put them on the same level. I think they're, I think it's two different feeds. I think it's two different I kinds. Think, I think there are two factors that, that lead to a higher quality kind of comment thread. One is identity, as you mentioned. I mean, at NPR, we found that, um, you know, sadly, but, but truthfully, that the comment, uh, the, the quality of the comments on Facebook was higher than the quality of comments we had on our own site because of identity. Because on Facebook, most people are who they say they are, and they're not going to, you know, be trolls on, the, on, on, on Facebook. And the second is the engagement is to not just let the comment, the commenters go off on their own. If you are, if it's comments on a, um, on a reported piece, the key is to have the reporter or the columnist or whoever it might be engaged in the conversation. That changes everything and it makes it fascinating. I, I feel like that's almost the secret sauce, is engagement, not just to let it go, but to be engaged in that comment stream as the publisher. Do you think identity leads to a higher level of accountability? Oh, absolutely. There's no question about it. And if we have a higher level of accountability, do we have a higher level of trust? Well, well, well at least people are going to, are, are not, are, you know, they are who they say they are for the most part. So they're going to be, you know, they're going to, 
they're going to they're wash what they say and try to be more thoughtful because their names are attached to it and their pictures. See, this and came the pictures up of their kids. This yeah. came up in our panel earlier. One downside, and, and we definitely considered this when we were implementing identity-based comments, is, you know, and it came up on our, our panel earlier, is once you remove anonymity in certain uh, countries where, you know, speaking out against the government or speaking out uh, against, you know, your internet being blocked in your country yeah. might be an incredibly dangerous thing to do. We lose that commentary uh, from those countries because essentially we're forcing them to, to log in with Facebook where they might get tracked down. So it's two sides. It definitely cuts down on spam comments, but it has that disadvantage of anonymity can actually be empowering. Yeah, it's interesting uh, in China on that line, even if you go into a, 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 a video games bar, you have to log in, sign a register, and give your name, give your address so they know exactly where you are in case they find that you're skating around on the web but not playing video games. So the, the, this question of, of anonymity, and we talked about this earlier, does have, uh, it's closely allied with the whole notion of, of privacy. Right, and what about privacy? Have you guys, uh, does, does it matter in terms of journalism, you think? Privacy in respect to uh, who's in providing. Getting to the facts, being able to be able to trust, you know, a source, being able to get good information. So what's going on in Syria today? You know, you know, people uh, have a hard time being able to get information, get real information. Well, this is where they strengthen the numbers. You, you, know, you won't necessarily trust one anonymous source, but you might trust a thousand or two thousand anonymous sources mm -hmm. who are eyewitnesses to the same event. But how many people trusted uh, a supposed gay girl in Damascus blogger? No, I'm saying that's and, an individual. And, 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 and we have to be careful with pictures too, because on the Vancouver riots, there's this picture of this romantic couple. People thought, yeah, yeah. in reality, was she was hurt and he was trying to comfort her, right? Right. <laughs> and this follow-up though, there's, there's here's what we think is happening, and and uh, this is a this is a really challenging issue these days, and it's really cuts to. Uh, the problem that social media has created in journalism and, and around trust is how fast are you going to get that story out? How much verification do you want? How much verification is acceptable? And you have this competitive pressure on you now because I remember when I started blogging, we like I, had a, I could get a scoop and have an hour or two to write it up, to contact some people. With social media, it could be breaking on Twitter and five minutes later, it's everywhere and, and you know they've been the heavily retweeted one or at the top of everything and suddenly you, you can't get a word in. So there's this huge pressure to get things out faster and faster and faster. Meanwhile, um, you know, you obviously want to put out stuff that's accurate. Uh, so there's becoming and some kind of spectrum along that where you, you have a level of certainty, but there's also becoming the ability to update all the time, say, here's what we know now, but we're going to keep updating. And you also want to own the conversation. So, so a great example of this was Rolling Stone when they, um, they had their McChrystal uh, exclusive on, on his, his uh, open chatter. And um, and they just had it in the print magazine, and it got got PDF scanned and put up by other people, posted by other people, and they lost the conversation. And I could totally see, as a, as a magazine editor, I could see wanting to own that conversation. If you want to read that story, that that breakthrough scoop, you have to buy the magazine. But it doesn't work that way nowadays. And and so somebody else scanned it, and it was out there, and they lost hours of essential conversation. Can I just say one other thing about the Vancouver riots? Because I think. There's a very interesting coda to the Vancouver riot story, which is the dark side of this great wisdom of the crowds, which is the people that were rioting, who have all been captured on Facebook, captured on Twitter, their pictures are out there. What's happening now is because they've been able to be identified through social media, whether they wanted to or not, they are now being, you know, and you may have your own opinions about whether they should be or sh should not be, but harassed, death threats, I mean, there's a, there's a vigilante justice that is happening in the wake of the Vancouver riots that is, that is a bit of the dark side of social media gone wrong. I think it's something important to keep in mind. Right. Well, it well, seems that social media has almost become the first draft of history, whereas mainstream media is the second draft of history. I mean, it's a little more dignified, right. staid, uh, reliable, and we've just sort of the waves keep washing well up. They travel at a different beach. speed, don't they? I mean, you brought up the speed issue. But also, I think even mainstream, uh, there's a lot of questions. There's been a lot of problems with uh, plagiarism in, in mainstream media lately. A lot of people have been, you know, a lot of bias now. I think people say, could say that a lot of the major mainstream newspapers have a bias one way or the other. So I want to ask you guys, uh, particularly you, Orville and Rajiv, 
do you think that the model of objective journalism is still working? And, or has it sort of, uh, or has bias sort of become the central to the new model? I, I think there's no doubt that, that people gravitate toward uh, the sorts of content that resonates with their own personal views, uh, political and otherwise. Um, but I still think that there is going to be, over the long term, a, a healthy market for objective, unbiased coverage. Um, I, I still think there's going to be a, a, a significant proportion of the population that will want to, to, to consume that sort of news, even though uh, you have, and we, you know, it's not just uh, exclusive to, to, uh, to uh, 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 you know, print and, and electronic content. Uh, you, know, you see it on cable television as well. Uh, I, I kind of have a contrarian view about bias and uh, and, and it's kind of a, a view that's emerging in, in our kind of web sector, which is that everyone is biased. If you're writing an article and you're left wing and you're writing about the Republican Party, you're biased, right? And, and you have to trust that person to try and ignore their bias. But you're, you're just hiding it. You're essentially, so this is about transparency and what if you could write what you think and disclose. And I think it comes down to transparency and disclosure. And we've had these you know, new social media policies with some of the newspapers where they say, well, you can't tweet any political opinions. Yeah. So is that honest? Is it honest to say, well, we're going to pretend that our writers don't have any political opinions, so it appears objective? Or could we be honest and say, we're going to write what we actually think, and you're going to know everything, and you can decide whether you trust our writing or not? I think this is the role of brand. You're bringing up how valuable the role of brand is, because in mainstream media today, particularly television and radio media, there's a lot of brands that are making a living you know, on, on their on, on bias, and, and well, you know they're biased. But I, I actually think, so John Stewart had it right uh, when he appeared on Fox a couple of weeks ago, um, and he, he made a distinction between people who operate on bias, people who, who's, who are delivering by, by, by function and, and purpose, they are delivering a um, partisan point of view, versus people who might have a perspective, um, but still are trying to have an have a objective to uh, present a fair story or an equal evaluation, a, an assessment um, based on uh, a pursuit of truth rather than a pursuit of ideology. And that's, a, that's an essential distinction that I think uh, actually uh, newspapers, um, many magazines in the U.S., in, the U in, in Europe actually, it's much more, the bias is much more part of the brand. But television obviously is, has a much larger problem with this in, in terms of Fox and and, and is, it, is it reckoning media, you think? Is, it, is, it, is there a point where everyone's losing trust? Well, I think uh, there is a good deal of that. But you know, I, I'm not sh quite sure I buy into this notion that we're all just sort of closeted people with biases we're trying to hide to get past the reader. I think the kind of really great journalism, in my estimation, and I've had this happen many, many times in my life, I'll go into a story and I'll have a kind of a, uh, predilection, and yet I will come out of the story. I've just written an article actually for The Atlantic where this happened, and I have a completely different perspective. I mean, yes, it is a bias at the end, but it wasn't the bias I went in with, and good journalism <laughs> discovers. I would also add, there's a huge amount of journalism. I mean, a lot of, a lot of this conversation about journalism comes down to talking about political journalism. There's a huge amount of journalism that has nothing to do with polit politics. So science journalism, which is an essential part of of how we learn things and how we're informed um, uh, is, is largely, um, oftentimes, not political. There are political aspects to it, but, but I think that's where you can get um, reporters who, who are looking to, to provide an answer or, or clarity to an issue rather than to get across a certain argument. Okay, well listen, we wanna take a few questions from the audience. We're just running out of time, so if people have a microphone, go ahead, this lady here. Can we give her a microphone, please? Right here? Right here, right here. I'm number two. We need to get you a microphone. <laughs> and if there's it, there's people with microphones out there, I think. So right if you have a question, find someone with a microphone. Um, first of all, I think everything is biased. Everything we read. I was so afraid about Iranian, so I went and I didn't want the newspapers to own my mind. So I went to Iran. I spent three weeks to find out about myself. And frankly, they all love Americans, okay? Except the bad revolutionary guards that don't like us. But um, also, but what I wanted to say, in terms of engagement, there's another issue to all the social media news, and it's um, inspiration. 
And that's what I like about it, the inspiration. I get inspired by other people's free thought and un um, unbiased opinions. And how does journalism get to be um, unbiased when the lobbyist runs our country? They well, completely run our country. And also, often the president doesn't let someone into a press meeting unless they're going to write an article that's um, amenable to the president. So your question is? My question what is, is, what is, I'll tell you what my question is. No. My question is, do you think that clouts that got um, released today finally made got a contribution through to the maid, paid her off? Why in the world was this man released? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're the smart ones. I'd love your opinion. So, okay. Did anyone else have a question? I can I say mean, I did read the article. Uh, guys, we're almost out of time, and there's a few people with a question. If you could just please not, not have a preamble and just go directly to the question, that would be okay, really great. Okay, so let me give that a shot. My question, Thank you so much. My question is uh, the topic. You guys good? Over here. Right here. On your right. On your right. The, uh, the question tonight was, is, and I apologize, this is a hardball question for the moderator. Uh, the topic tonight was, is social media good for journalism? And I was going to hit Ariana with this, but she's run off, so it's for the moderator. Isn't it in fact the truth is social media is bad for journalism because it steals the product from companies like the New York Times? Thank you. I think the title of the uh, panel, which was given to me by the Aspen Institute, was there to be a lot like... A lot like the titles you see on newspapers, when you get to the story, it's a little bit different. So <laughs> you here I think the title was meant to be provocative, not precise. But whether, I'm not sure if anyone wants to tackle the question. Do you guys want to talk about, is it good Social or not? Media. It's just the reality. Yeah, yeah. I think we're trying to give you guys a sense of yeah. picture yeah. of where it's the state yes. of the yes. world. Yes. <laughs> yes, social media is good for journalism. Yes, social media is good for journalism. It doesn't mean we don't like journalism. Right. I, right. Think, I think the point that's being made is that the business model for journalism is being challenged. And I think there's some degree, especially kind of implied there, that, that this is partially challenged by social media because the conversation's happening elsewhere, which is a point that you, you made. I think you know, the way we went about it was very much to say, um, you know, if people are talking about our stories, then that's a great thing. And if they're talking about them on Twitter or Facebook, that's a great thing. And more recently, we've been able to pull the conversation back onto our site by letting people log in with Facebook and Twitter, pull all the conversations back in. I, I think more people today than ever are reading my stories because they're being tweeted and they're being posted on people's Facebook pages. I think unequivocally it's a good thing for those of us who work in sort of the old line world of, of journalism. And Craig, I would hate for us to think that, the, that the, the good of social media is to be able to promote the stories that we air on television or on the radio or in print. It is about news gathering. It's about verification. It's about crowdsourcing. It's well beyond, yes, it's great that we can distribute links to our stories. That's a great thing, but there's so much more to it. It's very exciting, and we're just in the, you know, the top of the first inning right. with how powerful it can right. be. But, but the consumer here, let's talk about the consumer because they're the really ones that benefit more than anything because we now have more choices. It used to be that I have to just read my – I have two newspapers here in Aspen if I want to read about local. But now I can go on and through social media and Twitter and get other points of view about what's going on in my town. I mean, we have now, I mean, there used to be a monopoly on the news source locally from the local newspapers. Now we have local TV, we have, we have, we have the sort of media, war, there's, social media. There's war. more choice, there's more competition. If you're someone in a town who can write and who has the desire to report locally, you can probably uh, start to compete. I mean, it was all about distribution, wasn't it? So, you know, if you had the printing press, you had the trucks that were going to ship your newspapers out to uh, the doorstep, then you owned the conversation and you could reprint AP stories as much as you wanted. Now, suddenly, if you're competing with the whole web, you need to have something that's unique, that's maybe niche. Um, but that's separate from the social media. I mean, that is the web. That's what's changed there. And social media is just a part of that. But it, I don't think it's fair to blame social and, for and that. And can I just clarify? So, so there's a presumption oftentimes in these conversations that journalism is failing as a business model. And that's not true at all. Newspapers ha are, as in particular, have, have their business model challenged because of classified advertising. Some newspapers are finding ways to, to work around that, to re de, uh, redeploy their business model. The New York Times is, is actually um, back on track. Washington Post is doing some really amazing stuff. Um, there, there are other newspapers, uh, community newspapers, small newspapers that are being directly challenged. Magazines, my, my niche, 
are doing quite well, actually. Mag my, our magazine is just doing quite fine at serving the purpose that we are uh, designed to do, which is to s uh, create a point of view and deliver that to readers. Television is doing quite well. Television journalism, NPR, uh, thanks to Vivian's work, was, was, has been extraordinary in terms of journalism. So, so I don't want to, I, I think the presumption that journalism is failing and, and it's, again, that it's an either or proposition is just, is, is somewhat wrong. In fact, it, it, it's worthy uh, of pointing out that magazines like Wired and the Washington Post uh, have infinitely more readers now. Now, well, the problem is these readers are by and large not paying for anything. Right. Well, did you mention something to me privately that you thought, you're just gonna, you know, that the Post, now we can get rid of all the mediocre stuff and focus on the good stuff. That's what we need to be doing to be competitive. And unfortunately, the, the, the challenge for, for, for the Post, for the New York Times, for, 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 other, for other newspapers is, 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 is realigning that content. I mean, the monopolies that uh, metropolitan newspapers had in their heyday, damn good monopolies. I mean, they raked in the cash. And, uh, you know, boy, if, uh, you know, those, those newspaper owners could, could recreate those old days. That will never happen again. Um, but, you know, the dirty little secret is there was a lot of sort of pro forma stuff. There's a lot of schlock in, in the newspapers back in the day uh, that filled up the inside pages that surrounded the ads for mattresses and, and sporting goods and whatnot that are all now being sold via direct mail and television. Um, and so we have to be smarter about it. You know, in your world where you are now consuming the best of breed, you're going on your iPad and you are reading, you know, the best story about, uh, you know, uh, Dominic Strauss-Kahn, and you're reading the best story about, uh, you know, uh, the, the aftermath of the attack in Kabul the other day. Um, it, it, it's simply no good to be just shoveling out either wire service content or, or just, you know, uh, uh, or, you know, reciting what was said at the press conference an hour ago. It has to be value added. And the challenge that we all face is how do you realign your newsrooms to be producing the best possible content? The best content still finds a good home. It gets retweeted. It gets posted on people's Facebook pages. It gets commented on endlessly. It gets on the top of Ariana's uh, website and the Drudge Report and other places. And that's, that's a good thing in my view. That helps us, but we're just not producing enough of it. And our challenge, as, as with every other news organization, is to produce more of it. Okay, since you guys are all in the business, let's wrap up with a question. Any predictions? You guys want to make a prediction about the industry, social media and journalism, and the next year, two years? What's the number one thing you guys uh, think might be out there on the horizon? I th well, a year is a heck of a long time on the internet for starters. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, you look at Facebook, it's, you know, uh, six or seven years old, and we're suddenly at a position where, um, where it's taking over the world. I think, you know, the, the obvious next steps for, for online journalism are people going towards mobile consumption. There's business model potential there because it's a very polished product. People are sitting and consuming only your uh, newspaper or magazine or whatever. I think video is going to be huge going forward. People are wanting to consume stories in, in a way that is more visual. Um, and there's faster connections that are enabling that. Um, so obviously my two really obvious picks, because it's hard to predict what's gonna happen on the internet is massive mobile consumption and monetization there. People are prepared to pay for stuff on their iPad and their iPhone because it's a packaged good. And mm. big, big growth in video, much more consumption of video versus text. Before I get to my quick prediction, just back to the issue of investigative journalism, social media, real quickly. You know, the other day, two weeks ago, um, both the Washington Post, the New York Times, and a bunch of other news organizations decided a, to, to engage in a crowdsourced investigative journal ex journalism experiment when Sarah Palin's emails were released in Alaska. And uh, you know, these news organizations asked readers, you know, pour, you know, dive into this stuff and 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 get back to us with stuff. And by and large, the whole thing was a bust. Uh, now, in part, it was a bust because there wasn't a great smoking gun in this stuff, but it also was a bust because, you know, Alaska is a unique state. It requires a degree of, of knowledge about the arcane politics of that place, and you can't just sort of throw it open to the crowd and expect, you know, revelatory journalism to just sort of generate organically like that. In terms of prediction, um, I think that we'll see more paywalls, but what I'd like to see is a, two, is a paywall that's free on both sides. Not just if you consume under 20 stories a month, you get it free, 
but a model that, that also allows advertising to, to support a heavy user. Um, and that means if you're going to go on the New York Times site or, you know, let's say my, my employer decides to erect a paywall, if you're going to view 500 or 1,000 stories a month, we can find a way to make money off you from advertising, and it's free on that end, too, to generate increased usage. Well, I think when, you know, people leave school, the media becomes their major source of education. And I think new media, the Internet, social networks, whatnot, are, provide an incredible opportunity to sort of democratize and spread that, that learning, which is the, the foundation of any democratic system's ability to function. However, uh, I have to say, uh, in the prediction category, I'm not too sure that this is going to happen any more readily than it did with radio, with television, and, and with the internet. It seems to me that even as we have these miraculous new opportunities and technologies, the nation gets dumber. <laughs> uh, I have a lot of predictions about the future, and I don't want to repeat, so I'll just pick one specific thing, just to be a little bit different, which is um, the rise of the two-screen experience. I mean, this is already happening. People are watch television, listen to the radio, or, or engage in any kind of activity while they're on their device. But I think a more deliberate approach from um, news organizations to a two-screen experience. So I'm watching um, NBC Nightly News, for example. <laughs> and I am experiencing, and I am engaging with it. I am um, commenting on it. I am providing my own point of view. And the nature of being able to interact with a one-way experience in a two-way fashion, I think, is going to be a really fascinating area. Uh, so I think one, I mean, there's all sorts of uh, blue sky out there, but one area that I would talk about is um, the web is really a, a when you're in a web environment um, and, a, and a delivering journalism, you are forsaking um, your boundaries, the way you kind of contain that content. So, so as Rosie was saying, you're, you're, you may have one story that kind of gets out there, but the, the way you deliver it um, is you forsake that. Um, in magazines, for instance, that matters a lot because we, we create an experience um, and when you put all those stories on the web, you lose a great deal. So I think what you're going to see with, with um, more iPads and more other kinds of tablets is more micro curation, um, more ways of um, creating niches of content through apps and, and other things. And uh, my final prediction is I think comments are going to get a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> so but you think that content's going to be more atomized? And, 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 and mainstream sort of and, media companies and, will find and new curated and, and formalized in a sense. I mean, formalized meaning you will have borders around it. And they'll make more money than ever. Let's hope so. There we go. Thank you very much, everybody.